Hi, this is Visitor's Book and I'm Maya, your host. In this program, we're going to be meeting with diplomats and foreigners who are here in Pakistan, and we're going to find out what they really think about the country. So let's go. So today we're here at Trail 6, and we're here to meet with a German conservationist, Celeste von Chamir. So let's go find her. Hi, Celeste. Hi, Maya. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, thanks. So nice to see you. Nice to see you. So this is where you like to come and do some bird watching, right? This is one of the best places in Islamabad is to it? see birds. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so you're a German diplomat's wife. How long has it been for you here now? We've been here since uh, August 2017, so okay. that's about two and a half years. Right. How's the experience been for you so far? It's been an eye-opener in so many ways. It's been wonderful. We've enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And um, you've obviously traveled the world quite a lot with your husband. I mean, when did all of this get started? When did you start traveling with him? Where have you been before Pakistan? <laughs> Well, uh, we left Germany in 1993 wow. and went to uh, Paris. That was our first stop. That was part of his diplomatic education. Wow. And then he finished off and our first posting was Kiev, Ukraine. Okay. And after that, we went to Izmir, Turkey. Hmm. And after that, we went to uh, uh, Ivory Coast, okay. um, West Africa. And after that, to Mozambique and then to Zimbabwe back to Berlin wow. and now we're here. That's amazing. That's so many countries. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Does it ever get tiring to like constantly be on the move and traveling and... <laughs> the moves can be tiring, yeah. but aside from that, it's wonderful. Hmm, amazing. <laughs> you leave behind friends. That's true. But then you make new ones. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so should we start walking and find I'll the start birds? by giving you a pair of binoculars. Ooh, fancy. Okay. Okay, let's... These will help you see them better. Excellent. Okay, <laughs> off we go. Let's go. <laughs> Such a wonderful day today. Do you think we'll find many birds here today? Well, we normally see uh, between 40 and 50 species when we come here, if we spend several hours doing it. Fancy. And uh, one of the things that makes Islamabad, as in the capital of an Asian city, very special is the biodiversity that you have in this Ooh. city. Um, not only within the Margala Hills, but also you have Rava Lake and you have the plains outside. Is, yeah, many different places. Yeah. Is that like, uh, I mean, you mentioned that you specifically wanted to come here, right? We, yes, we, we're very lucky. We um, have a good chance of choosing where we come. Mm. And um, and that's quite unusual for diplomats, actually. Well, we don't get to say we're going to go only there. Right. We can say, OK, there's 10, pe 10 places we'd like to go. And huh. then they send us to one of those 10 places. OK. And uh, oh, we right, did put uh, Pakistan as number six mm. and uh, Islamabad specifically because of uh, because of this environment here. OK, so did you know a lot about Pakistan before you came here? Well, uh, we informed ourselves as quickly as we could when it became an option. OK. <laughs> Yeah. Obviously, what you hear about Pakistan is not good news, mm. um, and it's been refreshing to come here and find out that it's not, it's not, doesn't deserve the reputation that it has. Yeah. Pa Pakistan is a much more um, livable place and a much more positive place than, than the reputation. Especially Islamabad, yeah. Yeah, especially Islamabad. Mm. Yeah, and um, I mean that's actually what I was going to ask you because I think one of the reasons why so many foreigners like it here. So much is because the difference between the image they have in their heads mm. about Pakistan and then the actual reality, what they find here, is so different. Right. Did you right. find it like that as yeah, well? Yeah, we definitely found it like that. I mean, you read the most horrific things and mm. you come here and you see that it's not necessarily at all like what you read. Yeah, So exactly. Yeah. What do you think was the most surprising thing about the country? The most surprising thing about the country, I feel, is um, is how warm people are. Because I mean, you're sort of given to expect that uh, people are going to be suspicious or they're not going to um, want you to interact with them. But you come and you find out that the people are very warm and very friendly and very hospitable. Yeah, exactly. So that was a that was a surprise. Um, and. Uh, what else did we find that was surprising? Um, how how beautiful the city itself is. I mean, you see pictures, yeah. but then you come and look look at what's around you. Exactly. I mean, you, you come to this jungle in the middle of a city, yeah. and that's a big surprise. Yeah. Uh, because not too many cities have that. That's very true, and especially in like South Asian cities mm -hmm. and elsewhere in Pakistan as well. I think that's something really special about Islamabad is the 
nature right, that we have right. around here. And um, you've got a lot of people who are trying to protect that nature. You've got the Islamabad Wildlife Management Board. Hmm. They have camera traps out. And for instance, last week, they have footage of leopards here in this really? very in this very park. Oh God, now I'm uh, getting scared. <laughs> <laughs> no reason to be afraid. <laughs> they do come down from the mountains yeah. uh, this time of the year. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, hmm. Are there many here, actually? There's usually several that are camera trapped uh, every year. Fascinating. So, um, and then you've also got pangolins. You have porcupines. Often oh. you'll see little porcupine qu wow. uh, quills. And uh, we've recorded over 250 bird species. It's, I mean, that's, like you said, it's something quite special about mm. Islamabad. Yeah. You can't find that in Lahore, for example? No. Is that, yeah, that's no, only no. here. No, no, it's only here. It's Is only that here. because of the Margala Hills or just because it's so green? It's, it's a combination of factors. It's mm -hmm. because we're in what's called a... Um, a margin area between a mountainous habitat and a plains habitat. So you okay. have species from both areas that overlap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's also because the city itself is very green. Hmm. And the city offers many species that have the possibility to be in the city and yeah. uh, find food and find nesting uh, opportunities. Fascinating. Yeah. And um, what kind of birds can you find here actually? Anything like super exotic and exciting? <laughs> well, there's 10,000 species of birds on the planet or more. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so basically when you go from A to B, when you get to B, everything is exotic. Okay. So <laughs> at least for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you have some very, very beautiful, uh, colorful birds. You've got uh, what they known, uh, what's known as the red-billed Leothrix, which has got green and red and blue and all these different colors. Oh. You have the blue-throated barbet, which is very colorful. Um, you've got the uh, the um, coppersmith barbet, which is also very colorful. It's got green and white and red and several species of bee eaters, which are beautiful and colorful wow. as well. Sunbirds, these are birds that actually put their beak into a flower and, and drink the nectar of a flower. They are always very colorful. They're very yellow and purple. And yeah. there's one that's called the crimson sunbird because it really looks like a little crimson piece of fluff flying through the air. Oh, that's amazing. Lovely, and that's yeah. so funny, like I so rarely actually see these birds. Like I hear them all the time, no mm -hmm. matter where I am in Islamabad, you can always hear birds singing, which is really nice. Yeah. But I don't see them. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what you have binoculars yes. for today. <laughs> so where do you think we have to go to see them? Well, do we I have can... to walk like further up? Um, well, actually, we hear some things calling now. Okay. Uh, there's a, um, a greenish warbler, which is just calling off on the right. So you can actually recognize them by the sounds they make. It makes your life easier as yeah. uh, somebody who likes to watch birds if you can understand their calls. Wow. Because it, then you know, oh, okay, I, this species is now calling. If I want to see it, I can go find it. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. How, do you, how do you learn that? Like, is there like an online thing where you can listen to different bird calls and... and yeah. Yeah, there's an online resource called Say No Canto, mm -hmm. which has uh, birds calls from all over the world um, stored and the general public can just look them up by species name. Uh -huh. uh, you also have apps which help you. Um, you have apps which identify birds uh, and also have their calls as well. So it's much easier today to learn bird calls than it was, say, 20 years ago. Right, yeah, yeah exactly. Much easier. Yeah. 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 Are a lot of Pakistanis interested in bird watching, actually? Well, one of the reasons why we actually put um, Islamabad so high on our list was because mm -hmm. we did find an active birding community okay. here. Hmm. Um, Facebook is a big uh, source uh, for interaction in Pakistan. Yeah. And uh, there's a there's large groups on Facebook, Birds of Pakistan, Birds of Islamabad, oh. uh, Birds of Sindh, Birds of Punjab. Uh, they mm -hmm. all have their groups. Yeah. And uh, a lot of hobby photographers are putting up their bird photographs. Sometimes they need help with identification. Uh, sometimes they record the bird calls as well. They want to know what's calling. Mm -hmm, so yes, mm -hmm. there is actually a large group of, of um, bird watchers here in this country. That's great. Yeah. That's very nice. And another thing that came to my mind about the bird calls is that, is it like a global phenomena that some years the bird calls change? That they're not the same? Like I remember in Finland there was this particular bird, I don't know what it's called in English, but like it started getting like simpler and simpler every yeah. year. Yeah. Does that happen? Uh, bird like, calls are organic, if you want to put it that yeah. way, so they will develop over time. Uh -huh. um, in fact, they did uh, studies in South Africa on bird calls of robins, mm -hmm. and they started to incorporate the Nokia tone, 
they started to incorporate. Um, <gasps> yeah, I mean, they, 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 they mimic. So one, of the, one of the major things is mimicking with birds. Yeah, especially with parrots, I guess. With yeah. parrots, also with starling species, mm -hmm. minas, yeah. the, co the common mina, that's the most common bird. Right. In, yeah, in, the yeah. mina bird, yeah. Right, that one is, is well known for mimicking mm -hmm. as well. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned that there is this online project called eBirding. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, eBird fits into the general category of citizen science. Mm -hmm. And citizen science has become so important today um, to find out what's actually out there because universities and uh, study groups can't necessarily afford to send people everywhere to find out what animals exactly. are around. Yeah. So uh, they actually use citizens who are interested in wildlife to record things. Hmm. And eBird is um, from Cornell University and uh, they um, have a worldwide database that okay. uh, you can record your bird sightings and upload them and then scientists all over the world have access to what you've seen. Okay, that's very interesting. Have you done a lot of that here in Pakistan? Oh yeah, awesome. I am. I am the number three for um, eBirds as far as species recorded in Islamabad or even in Pakistan. So wow, we need to Impressive. encourage more Pakistanis to get involved in yeah. this sort of thing because we have a lot of photographers mm -hmm. and they and they put their stuff on Facebook, but it's not necessarily put on anything that actually is scientific. Yeah, and I see. citizens can be scientists or they can actually contribute to science as well. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, and it's. I think it's quite easy. Like, not just. In in Islamabad but like you mentioned there's so much wildlife in Pakistan oh, in yeah. general like uh, how many species are there well when it comes to bird life here in Islamabad we've got um, more than 250 have been recorded yeah. and in uh, Pakistan we're probably looking at close to um, between six and seven hundred yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah in fact they're recording that. new things even since the time I've been here they found species that they didn't know were here in Pakistan that are here yeah. Wow. And so much to discover. There's right. a lot to discover, yeah. In yeah. fact, even within this very park, there's things like leopards, as we were talking yeah. about, and <laughs> um, mm. wild boar. We see wild boar almost every time we come here. Okay. Yeah. So what do you do? Like, okay, so this is obviously a very common spot for people to come hiking, like let's say Sunday mornings almost, or all diplomats are here. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do if you run into, let's say, a leopard? <laughs> well, if you run into anything that could be potentially dangerous for you, the most important thing to do is not to run. Okay. You so don't like, run. Completely <laughs> counterintuitive, but okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so you never run from anything that's faster than you. Let me put it that right. way. Right. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, generally speaking, with leopards, they don't really attack people, so you yeah. shouldn't be. Uh, you shouldn't have major problems. That mm. leopard is going to run away from you. Yeah. Hopefully. Uh, it's going <laughs> to. In fact, you will probably never even know a leopard was there. Yeah, you so, never see that, yeah, right? I right. mean, like, they're very silent, I right. guess, and yeah. somewhere hiding. You they don't see you tell. as prey, so they don't want, to, they don't they want don't? you to see. Yeah, they don't hmm. see you as prey. Ah, there okay. we have something. We have something. Do you what think we're... we should take our binoculars <laughs> out? We could, we could have a look. What you <laughs> hear see. is a, um, you hear a tree pie. Uh, rufous tree pie, which you also see in the city. Okay. Um, they're sort of rufous on the back, and they've got a beautiful long tail. It belongs. It's a corvid. It belongs to the family of crows. Okay. And it also makes all kinds of beautiful sounds. Um, and it's back in that. Uh, we could try. Let's just. Yeah. Yep. I see movement there. Ah, uh, there we go. That's <laughs> oh, gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the. That's the thing about birding inside of a forest, is you can hear a lot and see a lot, yeah. but sometimes only as glimpses. <laughs> okay, let's see what we can find here. Okay, well, mm. there are um, some oriental white eyes. Oh yeah? Up there I can't find the them. Tree on oh. the if, you, if you follow the tree that's um, got the, um, you see this tree right through here that's in the sun, mm -hmm. and you follow the trunk up okay. to the right, Oh. Um, you should see some oriental white eyes up oh, there. Oh, there we go. Ooh, there's some movement here as well. Right. So those are very awesome. common. Wow. Great. Wow. We also um, have some Himalayan uh, boobles. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can hear them over there on the right. Yeah. So let's look over there on the right and see if we can yeah. see them. Let's go. Okay, so if you look up there, there's a tree that's kind of leaning to the left. Mm-hmm. And it's got some branches coming down. Have a look to see. Let's see if what those are. So Himalayan white, uh, Himalayan um, bulbuls, they've got a white patch on the side of their head. And they have a, some yellow feathers um, below the belly. That's how you can tell them from other, from other um, bulbuls. Species. Amazing. Yeah, they're very That's nice cute. as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs>
And what are we hearing now? What well, is that? What we've been hearing, what we hear now is just the, the black bulbul, but we also have been hearing what's called a jungle babbler. Oh, and we are okay. in the jungle, so it's a very fitting name. <laughs> Do they babble also? <laughs> they babble a lot. In fact, they're, they're like communal groups. They uh -huh. live in groups and uh, they're very common. We also see them in our gardens. And I just wanted to point it out to you so you can see. It's this uh, babbler here. That's oh, right. a kind of a thrush-like bird that's yeah. got a yellow beak. Nice. And they're fascinating to observe, mm -hmm. especially in, um, in this park because they divide up the park into territories. And because there are large groups, you'll have like family groups of seven that are in maybe larger groups of up to 25 or 30 birds. Okay. And you'll see them foraging. And if they get into the territory of the other group that may be living just across the path, and mm -hmm. interestingly enough, paths are often the territorial boundaries. Okay. Then you'll hear this huge ruckus, <laughs> basically, of these birds getting into it with each other, saying, no, you're on my spot, and oh you should God. need to be off my spot. They get into <laughs> wrestling matches, and they're all up in the trees, all shouting at the ones who are wrestling below. Oh, wow. Fascinating to watch. Wow. <laughs> it's actually really nice to see. <laughs> and it makes, um, these birds make living in Islamabad and also just going along the trails always more interesting because they're always up to something interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how did you actually get so passionate about wildlife and birds in particular? Well, um, before, about uh, 10 years ago, we were stationed at Ivory Coast during mm -hmm. the war. Okay. And uh, we were sort of confined to our garden quite a lot. Um, and while we were confined to our garden uh, for days at a time, we started watching birds. And once you pick up those binoculars one time and start looking at wildlife, it could just pull you into it and you become quite passionate about it. Wow. And I was actually going to ask you because, you know, being a diplomat's wife or spouse in general, it's like you're not allowed to work usually. So this is how you manage to fill up your time here, right? Yeah, I fill up, I fill up my life, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Wherever we go, I always find something to do. Yeah. And this is, this is one of the ways that I do that, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Maya, we've been birding for about an hour. We've seen several species, and it's been really, really nice to yeah. show you Trail 6 from my point of view. I'd love to invite you for a cup of coffee at my place. Amazing, let's yeah. do that. Okay. Great. We're going to take a short break. I'll see you in a little while. Welcome back, I'm here with Celeste and we're about to have some German Christmas cookies, right? That's right. Okay, can you tell me what these are? Well, the ones that are on the, 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 the rim of the plate are called Vanillenkipfer. Okay. So they're made from nuts and butter and sugar and nuts and butter and sugar. <laughs> uh, the ones you see in the middle, um, those are actually from a company called Basen, a very famous company in Germany that makes a selection of Christmas cookies. So you have them with spices and uh, with chocolate. Great, and this is like a tradition that you uh, make them at home also, like before Christmas and then you serve them all the way. That's true, throughout after, the entire season. Yeah. yeah. Great, let's try some. So when you got here in Pakistan, you got into documentary script writing. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I can tell you how I got into it and a little bit about it, yes. Um, wherever we live, I've always tried to somehow get involved in conservation because I'm a conservationist. And in this country, there are lots of organizations perhaps doing things all over the country on, in one way or the other, but what I found um, that I could do the most was to help people with awareness because awareness is a big issue here. Yeah. And um, so I met somebody who's a very talented um, filmmaker and um, he needed somebody to help him out with some script writing. Okay. So I got, into, I got into that. What kind of projects have you worked on so far? Well, um, the, the person I met, his name is Abdullah Khan, and um, he has uh, done a, a beautiful film on snow leopards, which has been screened in Karachi and here in Islamabad, and it actually won a big award in the States called the Jackson Hole um, oh, yeah. Scholarship cool. for Wildlife Films. So I've worked on a little bit of that with him. I've also worked on, um, we've worked on little, little information about, uh, little information like explainer videos about wildlife. Okay. There's one on the bio weaver, which is a little bird that builds a nest and it lives a beautiful a nest that hangs from trees. 
lives outside of um, Islamabad, so we did a, a little explainer video for that. And um, we've also worked on organic cotton, and we've worked on uh, natural indigo, and we're working on um, environmental standards for industries also okay. as so we do some serious things and some funner things yeah that's really great <laughs> yeah and you must have gone to travel quite a lot working on these projects right I've, I've gotten to travel quite a bit actually I've been down to Karachi um, working for some of these industrial things that we're doing uh, I've been to Siakot um, I've been to Lahore several times um, when it comes to wildlife areas I've been to some areas here in Punjab uh, some game re some game reserves that are good for bird watching um, national parks I've been to um, Deosai National Park mm -hmm. which is beautiful that's a second highest um, plateau in the world Wow there's a great book about it I don't oh, know yeah? if you've seen this book yet no the colors of Deosai oh wow Deosai is famous uh, for its the diversity of um, blooming wildflowers mm -hmm. so um, this particular author has done a great job on putting together the biodiversity and also the diversity of plants that you see in uh, Deosai. That's it's very well very worth a visit. Yeah was that like the favorite place you visited here in Pakistan so far or is there some other? That trip certainly and the north is always known as being the place to go for um, tourism in Pakistan and it is certainly stunning. It has been wildlife viewing certainly my favorite place because I was able to see the Himalayan bear which is also an endangered species. Yeah. Um, I saw a mother nursing her cub that was beautiful but all of Pakistan has something to offer. That's certainly been what I've been able to see. It's in the north, the south, it all has something that's that's fabulous to see. Yeah, and it's there's so much diversity, like in terms of like in the north you have the mountains and then in the south you have deserts and that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah you have basically you go from alpine um, habitats all the way down into sea um, sea level mangroves. Exactly. Um, that's as diverse as it gets in any any place on earth. Yeah. Really. So the snow leopard film that you worked on, what was like, where did you go to film it? How long did it take? And how many snow leopards did you get to see actually? I didn't actually get to see the snow leopards myself. Oh, you didn't? Okay. Uh, but I can tell you about the film and I can tell you because I did work on the film afterwards after uh -huh. it was actually shot. Oh, okay. Um, it was shot in Kunjarab National Park. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the shooting, when we say shooting, we mean filming, yeah. <laughs> actually took um, over two months because it's very, very rare to see these animals. Exactly. And Abdullah, who went up and did the filming, actually um, had been dreaming of getting these cats on film for a long time. And one of his friends contacted him and said, I know that there's snow leopards. Somebody from my community has contacted me about them. Mm -hmm. So he actually went up. That film is about a young man who wants to be a wildlife filmer and turns into a conservationist afterwards because I've seen the development of this young man as far as becoming somebody who's into conservation and, and filming about uh, all different aspects of it and I've been able to get involved with that as well. Um, and you can see that most of the communities where you film about wildlife, like BBC comes in mm. and they'll do a film about snow leopards, but people from the community never get to see it. Exactly. Because yeah, it's never it's put on a channel that they actually get to see. So what he's been trying to do is, is is to film things that people actually do get to see. And he has presented these films in the in communities and areas where people can actually watch it and see and learn about their own animals. When we presented it at the German embassy, we invited school children from Islamabad to come and see it. And one of the school kids walked up to me afterwards and said, I'm so glad you invited me to see this because I didn't even know we had these animals really? in, in Pakistan. And that's moving yeah, when a, a student comes up and says, you know, this is really wonderful. Thank you for showing it to me. So yeah. that's what it's about. And what is the biggest threat to the snow leopard population in Pakistan right now? Probably two threats. First of all, you have, uh, well, three, you have habitat loss because mm. as climate change happens, people are moving further and further up into the mountainous regions. So they're, so you're having more and more human animal conflict. That's one problem. Mm -hmm. And just the fact that the actual habitat itself is changing. So the common leopard is starting to get into areas where the snow leopard was previously there. I mean, that's with the information that we're hearing from the field. Yeah. But primarily it's habitat loss due to either climate change or a combination of climate change and human encroachment. And also, human and wildlife conflict because snow leopards will sometimes get into um, 
livestock uh, corrals. Mm -hmm. And if a predator is in a corral, it will kill everything in the corral yeah. because it doesn't, it can't just stop killing. And uh, that's, that's horrific for the farmer. Right. So that farmer is not going to tolerate that a second time. Are there any solutions to these problems? You have um, organizations that are working here in this country um, who are building corrals, uh, leopard proof corrals for mm -hmm. the farmers. So that's been done, that's been funded and done by the EU, by WWF, the Snow Leopard Foundation is also involved. Alternative uh, income is also important. There's a program on right now where the livestock is actually vaccinated, which reduces the loss of livestock due to sickness, which means that a farmer might be more tolerant if he loses a goat or so to a, to a snow leopard. So if you have a conservation organization doing that kind of work, actually helping them keep more animals alive, then the farmers are gonna be more tolerant towards the odd predator attack. Yeah, and what happens, like do the farmers end up having to shoot a snow leopard if they come or what happens usually? Sometimes, yes, you will have farmers who will shoot snow leopards, even in even if they don't really want to. Yeah. I mean, and, and uh, but it's simply, a, it's their livelihoods exactly. that are at stakes. And this is what you have to out overcome is you mm -hmm. have to help people with their livelihoods so that they can tolerate the wildlife when it encroaches on their livelihoods. And how many snow leopards are left in Pakistan at the moment? Oh, there's all different kinds of figures on that one somewhere between around two to five hundred I believe are the latest statistics and it's basically the snow leopards habitat it goes over several countries yeah. um, with these mountains and so you have them coming and going in between the countries it's very difficult to actually do the research on finding out how many are actually left but the estimates are between two and five hundred okay. yeah and the other interesting project that you worked on had something to do with indigo. This project that we filmed, uh, we did the work on, it's about returning uh, the natural indigo to the Indus Valley because the natural indigo is a plant, it's a plant, in fact, Indigo has its name from the Indus Valley. Oh, is it? Yeah, wow. and it's a very, very old tradition to make the color blue from a plant. Okay. In fact, it goes back to probably 5,000 years in the Indus Valley. And it's a flower, basically, It's right? a It's a plant. They actually make it out of the plant itself, not the flower, but oh, they yeah. make it from the leaves. And in fact, if you see indigo in uh, a field mm -hmm. and it's standing long enough, you'll start to see the leaves turn blue stains. Interesting. It's very interesting. So they actually, there's different ways of processing it to get the color out. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's a natural color and it's in very high demand right now in Europe. Wow. And it's wonderful to see the plant indigo return to the Indus Valley. And uh, that's a WWF project and they're working with several donors in order to help the farming communities restart their indigo production. Also connected with indigo is Adrak. I don't know if you remember or if you've seen Adrak before. Yeah, that's uh, in the kind of a pattern that they use. Yeah. In, the... in fact, I've got a piece here that I oh, purchased so from beautiful. a Cindy um, artisan. Uh, it's the stamp basically where they take colors and they, um, they put a stamp pattern onto a wow. cloth and then they dye it and uh, they are returning to this beautiful color blue originates from the plant indigo. So Adirak itself is probably 4,000 years old. Wow. And they've been practicing, it's amazing. And they've been practicing it pretty much undisturbed for 4,000 years in the Indus Valley. So it's a very old profession, yeah. yeah. It's making a comeback with the uh, color blue. <laughs> uh, yeah, so then that turned into a documentary. Is that well, we did a short documentary okay. uh, to basically present the fact that this is being returned to the Indus Valley. Mm. So, yeah. Amazing. And another really interesting thing that you mentioned to me was the organic cotton production that you worked on. Organic cotton is um, also becoming more and more de in demand in Europe and in the United States because people want to feel good about the clothes they wear, yeah. not just about the health benefits of having a natural product, but also the fact that what they wear may have had a, a less of an impact on the environment. Because cotton, uh, traditional conventional cotton is uh, something which um, can have detrimental effects on the environment. Yeah, and exactly. Organic, organic products, whether it be apples, oranges, or cotton, are becoming more and more popular. Mm. So there is an initiative also, it's a WWF initiative in uh, Baluchistan to introduce organic cotton to Baluchistan. 
and I was not able to go to Baluchistan, but at least I was able to work on the footage. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and there's a short film about that as well. Yeah. It's very exciting. Uh, so Pakistan is basically what, the fifth largest con producing country in the world or something like that? It's one of the largest mm -hmm. uh, uh, exporters and also they also import cotton here. Um, it's not just an exporting country but it's also an oh, importing country. Okay. And um, the reason for that is, is uh, despite the fact that um, Pakistan produces a lot of cotton, um, they haven't been able to produce the highest quality of cotton yet. Okay. And that's mm. another project that um, industry and also conservation organizations are working on uh, in order to help Pakistan also achieve the highest grade of cotton. Mm. So. And, and one of the major like environmental threats when it comes to cotton production is the pesticides, right, that are used? Well, there's different reasons why um, pesticides are bad mm. for the environment wherever you use them yeah. and uh, conventional cotton does employ a lot of pesticides. It's also a genetically modified seed uh -huh. um, yeah. which means that um, the farmers themselves aren't necessarily able to propagate that seed very well so it kind of keeps people dependent on purchasing seed. Yeah. So that's that, yeah. also something that has a disadvantage for especially poor people who are farming. Mm. Um, um, whereas organic cotton when you use organic seeds you should be able to propagate those seeds much easier than you would any gen genetically modified seed. Yeah. Um, and then the pesticides that are used are also organic. Pesticides, yeah. The organic pesticides um, are actually made uh, from plants that are grown in the area. And in fact, uh, one of our farmers that we interviewed said that it's actually much cheaper for him uh, to make the pesticide himself as opposed to having to purchase the pesticides that he would for um, his conventional cotton. So they make them from five or six different plants. There's even YouTube videos on how to make pesticides. Yeah, right? <laughs> there are, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So you mentioned that the farmers were mostly very happy about this project, but what about the industry in general? Is it easy to convince it to become more like environmentally sustainable in this country you have different um, players on all different levels and a lot of the larger companies have become environmentally let's say eco-friendlier yeah. because there's a consumer driven demand that they actually become eco-friendlier and for their products to be sold in Europe or in the US yeah. so a lot of the big players actually already have all kinds of things in place and, and their footprint their ecological footprint is, is lower mm -hmm. than say a lot of the small and medium business okay. that don't have the margin the profit margin to invest in a lot of these things okay. um, so it, the work that I've been able to participate in, I've actually been able to go into all different levels of production in this country. And so I've met like stuff that's more modern probably than most European units would have mm. because these people are really into investing in modern technology and to, to having basically a zero hazardous chemical discharge policy. But I've also been places where employees are standing in water that's full of chromium. Mm. So there's all different levels here. And that's uh, that's one of the big challenges that, that Pakistan faces. It's just the, the that there aren't any standards that are being enforced at this time, but the country is moving toward standardization and moving toward regulation, which is a good step for the country. Yeah. And you got to visit like actual uh, factories where like textiles are produced and... and I did, kind of, yeah. Where, where was that? It was part of the Well, um, basically your, your major textile areas in this country are Lahore, Karachi, Faisalabad. Um, you've got um, leather production in Lahore and uh, you've got leather production in Karachi also in Sialk and Siaco yeah, so yeah. yeah so and it's a big portion of the population which is employed yeah, um, the industrial labor force about 50% is employed in these two industries mm -hmm. it's a big uh, it's a big deal for these companies to move toward a different um, standard of of production. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you know what? The sun is shining outside and it's a lot warmer outside than inside. Yeah, usually it is in these old houses. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Shall we go have a sit in the garden? Yeah, let's do that. We're going to take a short break. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. I'm here with Celeste and we're sitting in her wonderful garden. 
You mentioned that you've spotted around 60 different species here, right? Yeah, we have. We do bird counts everywhere we live. <laughs> um, and we've counted um, 62 species here, including an owl. Just in this garden? Just in this garden or from this garden. Oh, Meaning wow. if we see it flying over, we also count it. Okay. But wow. um, we do have an owl. It's a regular visitor. No way. He comes and perches and uh, hunts small little creatures that are crawling around on the ground <laughs> every night or close to every night. That's amazing. And, wow. Yeah, lots of and you mentioned that one of the reasons you wanted to live in this particular house was the trees, because then you get to see so many birds, right? That's right. I mean, we try to choose a place to live when we move, which we know we would like to spend time at. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we are more outdoor than indoor people. The inside of our house is kind of old fashioned, uh, but the outside has a beautiful garden and uh, things grow very, very quickly here. A lot of what you see around you, we planted just two and a half years oh. ago. In fact, this whole this whole wall was bare. Is it? So it's it's amazing how quickly oh, things incredible. grow. This was planted last year. Yeah. And um, these things also grow very quickly. And anything that has flowers uh, or seeds will attract birds. Okay. So we we also get a lot of birds for that reason. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. Yeah. So another thing I wanted to ask you about is like sustainable living, basically. What do you do in your everyday life to protect the environment? What everybody can do in their everyday life and what we also do is we try not to use too much water. Okay. Um, water is a big issue in Pakistan. Hmm. Pakistan is going to be one of the hardest hit countries for uh, water when it comes to climate change. One of the top seven in the world. So the impact is going to be very high here. People have already said that they have to have to have their two wells go deeper now to get water even in Islamabad. Mm. So water's a big issue. We, we don't leave things running. We don't wash our terraces with water. Okay. We sweep, mm. um, we mop, but we don't like run, use the running water, which yeah, is exactly. so popular here to do. Oh, yeah. We don't, um, one of the things we also do is we wash our cars, but with buckets and no soap. Mm -hmm. So okay. we just use water and uh, a cloth. You don't have to use soap. Your car gets clean without soap. Yeah, exactly. Um, and another thing, we use uh, Papu Recycles. That's a local company that will come and pick up everything that's recyclable. Okay. So they come and they pick up our cans, they pick up our bottles, they pick up our paper, they pick up, pick up our uh, Tetra Packs. So they come once a month and they pick up all the recyclables. So there's less trash going into the, into the streets yeah. and uh, more things that are actually being recycled and being valued as something that's recyclable. That's another thing anybody can do in Islamabad because they uh, service Islamabad. Yeah, and that's one of the things that you notice here is that you, you see garbage. Mm -hmm. It's just there out on the street. Uh, why, why is it like that here? Well, there's a lot of things that when it comes to solid waste management that have to be in place for it to actually work. And um, Islamabad is still struggling with where do they want to have landfills? Yeah. How does this, how is all this going to work? And um, until these problems are solved, people are going to do what they have to do yeah. and they're going to leave the garbage at the end of the street and then pickers come and they pick out what they can sell like the right. plastic bottles and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what about organic products? Is it easy to find them here? And do you try to like use organic products whenever you can? Well, we buy our fresh vegetables and, and um, we, we buy things from, from the, the vegetable sellers that are here. I don't specifically try to go organic, although there are people who sell organic products. Um, pretty much it's like private people who sell. We actually have a vegetable garden where we grow a lot of our, oh, okay. our own vegetables as well. Oh, that's nice. Um, there are some, I think if you go to the Saturday market or the, the farmer's market, yeah. there's people who sell organic food there. Mm. So you can, you can buy that there. I don't specifically go and try to buy organic. Um, I ask if I'm somewhere, but I'm probably somebody who's a little more skeptical on what's organic and what's not organic. Right. So mm. I will buy pretty much if a vegetable seller is selling something to me, I will buy it. Yeah. Does it affect your um, eating habits at all? Like your interest in the environment? Well, there's a lot of people who are like vegetarians because they're, uh, they want to um, not have to kill something to eat it. Um, to be honest with you, no. Mm. My husband and I try to eat healthily for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Do you enjoy Pakistani food? Do you go oh, out to eat a lot Oh, here? yes. We do enjoy Pakistani food immensely. Yeah. Uh, we have a very good Pakistani cook. 
uh, who also cooks European food. So uh, we tend to enjoy the ambience that you have here around you. We sit in our garden a lot, we sit on our terraces a lot and, and have our meals there. We do go out, but not as much as many people do. I mean, we're an older couple, so yeah. we don't, we're not. <laughs> oh, come on, you're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we don't, but we're not the, the kind that goes out and tries every restaurant. Right. We're more of a, we're more homebodies. Yeah, okay, <laughs> that's fair enough. Um, so you you are from Germany, but you obviously grew up in the States as well, right? I, I spent half of my life in the States and half of my life in Germany. Okay. So I spent, uh, I'm basically a mix between the two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you studied in the States or how? I studied in go? the States also in Germany. Oh, so okay. I went, so my schooling is in both in both in Where both in the countries. States? I studied in um, Gainesville, mm -hmm. which is Florida. And in uh, Germany, I studied in Bonn. Okay, is either one of your parents American or both of them are German and you just ended up in? No, I US. have a split family, oh, so okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That makes so, sense. yeah. Do you go back home a lot? I go back to Germany to see my German family and relatives once a year, and I go back to the States to see my US relatives once a year. Yeah, so <laughs> twice a year you go back yeah, home. Yeah. Is there anything you miss in particular from back home aside from friends and family? Um, well, you know, we've been traveling now for the past almost 30 years, yeah. so it's hard to, what you do find out when you live this kind of life is that um, your home changes as you change. Mm. So you end up developing into the kind, into a different person away from your homeland, yeah. or homelands in my case. And so you find that as your life goes on, um, that maybe attitudes and styles and, um, philosophies have changed in your home country mm. so that uh, it becomes interesting to discover every time you go back what's different now and uh, so I, do I miss anything specific I can't say that I do I mean in Germany the it's wonderful everything functions so well there yeah. I mean <laughs> the, the streets are clean the the, uh, the streets are very well built and you can drive very fast without having to worry about you know too much traffic mm. and that sort of thing that's very nice um, but there's nothing I would say that I, I miss terribly. I, I, there's still so much to see. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what about the conservation movement? Uh, is it still a little bit new here in Pakistan? Because like, it's been going on for quite a long time in Germany, for example, and in the West in general. Yeah, uh, Germany, uh, Germany and the West in general has basically been involved in conservation in a big way since even the 70s and yeah. 60, 70s and 70s. Mm. Um, in some areas, they even got involved in conservation in the 50s. So um, it is very new to Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan, like many developing countries, they basically have concentrated on developing uh, first and then let, we'll look at the environment later. That seems yeah. to be an attitude that is in a lot of places. Yeah. Um, the, but you have to sort of, your human development has to catch up with your human population as well. Exactly. And, um, and taking care of the environment, which does have an effect on you as a human, is part of human development. So we have to start to raise awareness in this country so that people realize that a healthy environment means healthier people, yeah. um, and not just for the birds or for the animals or for the plants. It's, mm. it's about our own lives. Yeah. yeah. Uh, have you gotten a chance to interact with Pakistani youth at all here? Yes, um, we've had several different um, events where youth have come. Um, we've also, uh, we, we do, when we're filming out, we, we see quite a few people yeah. who come up and ask us what we're doing. There's one a very, very good uh, example of Pakistani youth that's involved in conservation. He's mm -hmm. a young man who uh, volunteers for WWF and he volunteers for um, the Islamabad Wildlife Management Board. His name is Moheb. Mm -hmm. He's 17 years old and he's probably one of the top wildlife experts for this area wow. that I've ever met that's because so he's impressive. been involved since he was 12. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. So would you say like the youth is like they have maybe a little bit more awareness than older people in Pakistan about like nature and the environment and that sort of thing? I would say the youth the youth is probably open to it more or mm. there's a lot of young people that are more open to it than yeah. perhaps older people who just more or less are still trying to establish themselves financially yeah, and exactly. they have different goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any like you mentioned this this uh, particular person from the WWF but what other projects have really inspired or impressed you here in Pakistan? 
Well, this particular person I was mentioning, he volunteers for WWF. The Islamabad Wildlife Management Board, uh, that is a group of very, very involved individuals who are doing their very best to protect this very place we were in today. Yeah. Um, uh, they inspire me, the people on the board inspire me. Uh, Dr. Anis Rahman is one of the um, conservationists in this country. He is probably pivotal for setting up Deosaya National Park. And if it weren't for him, I don't think we would have Himalayan brown bears in this country anymore. Oh, that's incredible. Um, Very important yeah, work. Though. Yeah. Has Pakistan taught you anything? Yes, I've learned a lot here in Pakistan yeah. and it's unbelievable. It doesn't matter how old you get, you can always learn something new when you go to a new place. Mm -hmm. um, I've learned to value people's people trying to do things because it's not, because there are environments which enable you and environments which don't enable you. Hmm. But if you have people who are trying to get things done in an, in an environment that isn't always very enabling, um, I, I, I found that just attempts to do things is worth a lot when people understand um, what they want to do. And I've, I've learned to value that, that success, the success that we're used to in our Western cultures, and we're sort of like lineal. Mm. Um, it doesn't always work that way. It's a process. It's more of a process here. I've certainly uh, learned to value that. And is there anything that you will miss about Pakistan when you finally leave? I have met the highest caliber of people I've ever met anywhere in this country. And I will certainly miss a lot of the personal relationships that I've developed here. Um, I will miss I will miss these beautiful surroundings. I'll miss Margala Hills. I'll miss truck art. I'll miss seeing oh, yeah. truck art <laughs> being made as opposed to just appreciating it on the websites. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then it's time for our rapid fire round. Oh, Are dear. you ready? Okay, I'm not sure what it is, <laughs> but I'll, I'll find out. <laughs> okay. Shalwar kameez or Western clothes? On men or women? <laughs> On you. Um, well, I'm, I'm dressed pretty fairly traditionally today. Yeah. Depending on the circumstances, I like both. Okay. Lahore or Karachi? Karachi. <laughs> uh, what comes to your mind when I say Pakistani people? Hospitality. The Berlin Wall. Thank heavens it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Truck art. Beauty. Uh, Swat Valley. Oh, Swat Valley is stunning. Stunning views, clear waters, uh, birdsong. Um, Deosai National Park. Wildflowers, Himalayan bears, marmots, um, fabulous surroundings. Northern Pakistan or German Alps? Okay, I'm going to have to divide this into two. Scenically, obviously, it's uh, northern Pakistan is one of the most stunning places you can ever go. Mm -hmm. For organizational skills, Germany. <laughs> yeah, I think Germany wins on that, hands down, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> okay. Uh, Pakistani or German desserts? German. Mm, okay. Uh, Sauerbraten or Nihari? Nihari. I agree. <laughs> um, German sausages or Sikh kebab? Sikh kebab, by far. <laughs> the best thing about Pakistan? The best thing about Pakistan, this sounds very banal, but it's Pakistan itself. It's a fabulous place. Great. All right, then it's time for you to sign our visitor's book. Oh, fabulous. Let me open it for you. For this, I need my glasses. Here we go. Go. Oops. So okay. you can write your name and your comments. Okay. Okay, let's see what you wrote. What a lovely show which aims to portray Pakistan through the eyes of its visitors. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I had such a lovely time with you. I hope you continue to enjoy your time in Pakistan. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you. That's it for today. Please join me again next week. And don't forget to follow us on our social media handles at indus.news. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.